Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. I hope you guys enjoyed our last video on World War II myths and films, because now we're going to take a deeper dive into World War II combat, specifically focusing on tank warfare. We'll be mainly focusing on the Western European theater, because unfortunately there just aren't that many movies about the massive tank battles on the Eastern Front. Also in the Pacific theater, tank-on-tank -tank combat was relatively rare. The M4 Sherman tank is given a lot of flack by pop culture, movies, and even war historians. As a matter of fact, a lot of allied tankers from Brits to Poles gave them nicknames like Burning Coffins or Tommy Cookers. Most people just assumed that the German tanks were far superior to the Sherman tank. And this stereotype has been pushed by almost every World War II film with Sherman tanks in it. The film The Battle of the Bulge is perhaps one of the worst offenders of this trope. The movie showcases the German surprise counterattack through the Ardennese forest that created a huge salient in Allied lines. This attack was spearheaded by German mechanized and armor units, and most famously the King Tiger and Panther tanks. There are a lot of problems with this movie. For one, it was filmed in Spain, so there just wasn't enough snow on the ground to really recreate the battle scene. The Battle of the Bolts took place during very heavy, blizzard-like conditions, and deep snow played a huge part in limiting the movement of tanks on both sides. The movie also falsely asserts that the Sherman tanks were just thrown into the meat grinder in order to tire out the invulnerable German Tiger tanks. In reality, Sherman tanks rarely ever ran into Tiger tanks. From D-Day until the end of the war, there were only three or four encounters between American Army Sherman tanks and the Tiger tank. The Tiger and the Tiger Mark II King Tiger was extremely heavy, guzzled gas, and relatively unreliable, which meant that the massive vehicle had trouble navigating the uneven ground around the Ardennes Forest, and in most cases never even made it to the front. On paper, the Sherman tank looks inferior to its German counterparts, but the M4 platform was the result of many years of R&D and field testing during the North African campaign. One of the biggest complaints about the Sherman tank was that it was a death trap and easily could catch on fire whenever the ammunition was struck or the gasoline tank, as seen in this shot right here with a burnt out Sherman. Now, this is true to a certain degree. The earlier Sherman tanks had welded armor, which had a lot of weak spots on it, and also the tanks were powered by gasoline instead of diesel, which is a lot more flammable. Earlier Sherman tanks also lacked wet storage for their shells, which made it much easier to blow up. Wet storage literally meant storing the shells in liquid, so if the round is pierced, it hopefully will be too wet to ignite. But these same design flaws could be seen in other tanks during this era as well. As a matter of fact, the Sherman tank crew survivability rate when it was hit was almost identical to German tanks and even better than Russian tanks. As the war went on, Sherman tanks improved tremendously. This was due to the implementation of what ammo storage, diesel engines, but also because Sherman tanks were relatively easy to escape from. The commander hatch was spring-loaded and much easier to remove, especially when compared to a T-34. The Sherman tank also had a roomier interior thanks to its smaller 75mm gun. The armor of the Sherman tank, while thinner than their German counterparts, was just as effective because it was sloped at an angle. As a matter of fact, the Russian T-34 tank is widely praised for its sloping armor, which is actually very similar in design to a Sherman tank's. So the problem with Sherman tanks wasn't that the armor wasn't thick enough, it was more that the Germans had just crazy powerful cannons in the 88mm and the high-velocity 75mm. However, the Sherman traded heavy armor for lightweight and mobility, which meant it could go places where the larger German Tiger and Panther tanks couldn't. The other common trope we see in the Battle of the Bulge is the Sherman tank's rounds bouncing off the frontal armor of the German tank. Again, I'm not really sure if this is a Panzer IV or a Panzer V Panther or a Tiger tank, but at this ridiculously close range, even the low-velocity 75mm on a Sherman should be able to pierce the frontal armor, especially when they're using an armor-piercing round. It should also be noted that by 1944, most Sherman platoons had at least one modified M4A3E8, which featured the EZ 876mm high-velocity cannon, while the British had their own Firefly turret Sherman tanks with a 17-pound anti-tank gun on it. Both of these modified Sherman tanks were designed specifically to take on the frontal armor of heavier German tanks. Another myth about Sherman tanks is that it took around five of them to take out a Panzer V Panther tank. This is kind of a half-truth. While most engagements between American and German tanks did feature numerous Sherman tanks and only one or two German tanks, that was just because Sherman tanks were usually deployed in a platoon of five tanks. According to after-action reports, 
Sherman tanks only needed a 2 to 1 ratio against defending German tanks in order to win the battle. And when the Shermans were defending, that ratio was even lower. From D-Day to the end of the war, Sherman tanks had a much better kill ratio than their German counterparts, and that was due to a variety of factors including better air support, more experienced crews, and more reliable and fuel efficient tanks. So yes, the Sherman tank was inferior to the German tanks on paper, but in reality they actually performed quite well. Now on the other side of the battlefield we have this image of the fearsome German tank which is invulnerable and can take out a whole column of Sherman tanks like in this scene from Fury. While situations like this actually did happen during the war, it was extremely rare. While Fury is definitely a huge step up in accuracy compared to something like the Battle of the Bulge film, this tank scene still is a bit suspect. For one, Fury is an easy 8 upgraded Sherman tank, and that alone should have been able to take out a Tiger tank one on one. Although statistically speaking, the first tank that fires in an engagement usually won. But the Tiger was outnumbered by 4 to 1 and had hit one of the normal low velocity 75mm tanks first and not Fury. As a matter of fact, it's kind of strange that the Tiger tank left the Easy 8 Fury tank for last and didn't focus on hitting that one first. German tankers were actually known to target these upgraded Sherman tanks because they knew they could do a lot of damage. This is why Sherman tank crews with these upgraded tanks usually tried to disguise them. Also, when ambushing a tank column, it's a better idea to hit the first tank so that the rest of the column becomes stuck. In this scene, for some reason, the Tiger tank hits the last tank in the column and allows the other tanks to still have room to maneuver. Eventually, Fury is able to use its speed and flank the Tiger and hit it in its vulnerable rear armor, which I learned how to do in Battlefield 1942. But again, even the frontal armor of the Tiger tank can't withstand an easy 8, so moving that close was completely unnecessary and incredibly dangerous. Nonetheless, the movie is really awesome, and that scene specifically is really cool, so definitely do check that movie out if you have a chance. So while the German tank cannons were generally more powerful than their allied counterparts, their armor was still susceptible to a wide range of anti-tank weapons along with allied bombers. But the biggest problem with the Tiger tanks and the Panther tanks was their reliability and fuel efficiency. The Panther tank was poorly designed and rushed into combat. Originally planned as a 30-ton medium tank similar to size in the Sherman tank, Hitler demanded it have a larger cannon and more armor, which resulted in an extremely heavy and underpowered vehicle. Two weeks into the Battle of the Bulge, out of the 415 Panther tanks deployed, only around 200 were left, and more than half of those were not able to move anymore because they didn't have enough fuel or they had broken down. In case you guys haven't noticed already, most of these movie clips that I've shown you don't actually show the tanks I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, a lot of these tanks aren't even from World War II. In the Battle of the Bolt film, all the tanks are wrong. The German tanks are mostly M47 Patton tanks, and the Sherman tanks are actually M24 Chaffee light tanks. That biopic Patton ironically uses M47 and M48 variants of the Patton tanks and the M41 Walker Bulldog light tank. In the film Big Red 1, during the Battle of Kasserine Pass, modified Israeli Sherman tanks with Israeli tank crews are used to portray the Germans, which is about as wrong as you can get. Saving Private Ryan does a little bit better, and the two Tiger tanks used in that film are built on the modified T-34 chassis. It wasn't really until Fury came out that you actually got to see a rare functional Tiger, which is borrowed from a museum. A lot of World War II films portray being a tanker as one of the most dangerous professions on the battlefield. Now, I'm not saying that it wasn't dangerous, but it definitely wasn't the most dangerous. And I think the problem, the reason we've developed such a notion is so many first-hand accounts of the war from the point of tankers is just terrifying. But statistically speaking, being a tanker was much safer than, say, being a rifleman. Only around 3-4% to of tankers died during the war, and most of these men died from gunfire when they were outside the safety of their tank or on guard duty. Compare that to the 18% mortality rate of riflemen. Or even worse, RAF bomber crews suffered from around a 44% mortality rate. It's one of those things where it's so obvious that you think it's not true, but it actually is true. Because if you really think about it, being behind 2 inches of steel is the safest place on a battlefield, by far. When the Germans advance on the paratroopers holding the fictional town of Rommel and saving Private Ryan, they use a strange tactic we oftentimes see tank crews use in Hollywood films. The German tanks are sent in first, and the infantry are sent in afterwards. In reality, something as large as a Tiger tank would probably never be sent into a town with such narrow streets, especially if it was occupied by enemy troops and no infantry units were sent to support that tank. Again, we go into Battlefield. If you've played the series, you know it's relatively easy to sneak up behind a tank and blow it up, if there are no infantry units surrounding it. 
On an actual battlefield, it's probably even easier to sneak up on a tank that's not guarded by infantry because there's no third person view in real life. Or at least I haven't figured out what the button is yet. On the American side, tank doctrine dictated that the M4 Sherman was to be used as an infantry support weapon and were rarely ever deployed without supporting infantry. And that's because the people who created this doctrine were actually artillerymen. They saw the M4 Sherman tank as a moving piece of artillery, not as an anti-tank weapon. He had special tank destroyer platoons for that job. Since tanks were first used in World War I, tankers have known not to deploy without infantry supporting them. During the first ever tank assault at the Battle of the Somme, British tankers quickly advanced through German lines and forever changed warfare. On the second day of the battle, most of those Mark IV tanks broke down and were surrounded by enemy infantry or destroyed by artillery because they had vastly outpaced their own supporting infantry. And lesson learned. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist. And by protagonist, I mean you could be a villain or a hero. I'm not gonna limit you like Ben does.